Hello and welcome, I'm Ali Mustafa and this is Straight Talk. Turkey to hold snap elections on June 24th. We'll tell you what it means for the future of the country. And Turkey and Greece at loggerheads, could recent tensions destabilize the region? Turkish voters will go to the polls in a snap election on June 24th, more than a year ahead of schedule. The elections will lead to the introduction of a presidential form of government in Turkey. Turkish President Erdogan announced the decision after meeting the head of the nationalist MHP party, Devlet Bahçeli, who floated the idea of early polls. Erdogan says the time is right for elections. Suriye'deki gelişmelerin hızlandığı makroekonomik dengelerden büyük yatırımlara kadar her konuda çok önemli kararlar vermemiz gereken bir dönemde seçim konusunu ülkemizin gündeminden bir an önce çıkarmamız şart. So how would an executive presidency be different from the current parliamentary system? Currently the prime minister heads the government and the president is the head of state. Under the new system the post of prime minister will be scrapped and the presidency will be empowered. The president will also have the authority to appoint cabinet ministers and some positions in the judiciary. The number of legislators will rise from 550 currently to 600, increasing the president's accountability. Critics say this might put too much power in the president's office, but supporters say the switch will make the system more efficient. To discuss these early elections, I'm joined in the studio by Salim Atala. He is a journalist at 24 TV and by Mehmet Çelik, who is a columnist at Daily Sabah. A good decision or bad decision? I'll begin with you, Mehmet. I think it's a necessary decision. Good or bad uh, is very, uh, you know, you can, depending where you're standing, you can say it is good or bad. But looking at the current situation in Turkey, looking at uh, particularly the dynamics after the July 15 coup attempt, I think it is a necessary step to uh, hold the election so that things can run smoother um, between the, uh, the, the presidency Let's and, talk and the about cabinet that. Let's itself. talk about the July 15th uh, coup, the failed coup attempt, and after that, this galvanization, political galvanization by the ruling AK party, but also a state of emergency, which has now been renewed at least six times and has just been renewed recently. Should elections be held, as the opposition says, they shouldn't be held in a state of emergency. What do you think, Salim? Uh, Salim? Should they know. be held in a state of emergency? What, what, what would Emmanuel Macron say? I think he ran under the state of emergency. And uh, if they say they lifted that state of emergency, now all those uh, state of emergency laws are coded into the regular laws. So on paper, on the label, they don't have any, but the France for instance, is now under state of emergency. So you, you think what applies to France applies to Turkey? Uh, not necessarily. Every country runs its own course. But uh, some countries have less say than the others on certain things. And we hear too much France these days. Maybe I'm, that's why I'm distracted with uh, Monsieur Macron's comments. But overall, uh, early election, why? Well, it's a good idea, why? Uh, extended campaigning is always destabilizing for any country. Just things are, things get on hold, economy gets on hold, uh, no one uh, does any real serious work, everyone is waiting for Well, the but that's your, that's your opinion. That's your opinion, it destabilizes it. The opposition would, would uh, disagree. They'd say that, you know, by holding early elections, we don't have any time. Even the well, United actually, States is, is let's bring in. Let's bring in Mehmet. Actually, 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 the, that's, not what the opposition, that's not what the opposition says. Opposition says they've been ready for a long the time. The CHP is saying, the bring CHP it on. The CHP has been saying bring that, bring it on. Bring it on. I mean, uh, the Saadet, E party. E party um, uh, disagrees HDP a bit. Even. E party says, okay, yes, we will contest, but... Uh, they haven't had time to prepare for it at all now. Well, they, they said that they, you know, they've been ready and they are ready to face the challenge. However, it is up to them to actually For the benefit of our viewers, uh, the E-Party -par led by Meral Akshanar is an offshoot of mostly MHP nationalist uh, um, activists who have formed this new party, but they've gained a lot of traction, not just within the MHP, but also CHP. Salim. Again, just... Uh Parties are supposed to be ready for elections regardless. And then uh, in every country, 
the, the ruling party happens to have the last word on the date and time of the election. So let, let, let me let me timing, let me let me pause. Matters. Let me open it up a bit. Sure. The ruling party has time, has the advantage. Uh, was approached by the MHP, Devlet Barcelli, who is a coalition part partner of the ruling party, calling for early elections in August. But the decision was made to hold it in June, which is like 15 months away from the original date in 2019. So quite a bit of maneuvering there politically. I think what the President Erdogan's, what's going on in his mind is that if it is going to be early elections, why wait such a long time? And, and given also the fact that it will be summer. It, there is some certain holidays in Turkey. People are away. Um, and also, why drag it uh, for a few more months and, and not hold it earlier? If it is going to be early elections, like Mr. Uh, Atalay said, why, you know, for example, in bureaucracy, in economy, decisions are made. Um, they need to be made uh, quickly. Uh, but when there is an election atmosphere and a prolonged election atmosphere, and also if it is an early election, then no, no decisions are being taken. The GDP declines in the electioneering campaigning period. Well, you raise an interesting point, Salim. Yes. It's quite a critical time uh, for Turkey. A war internally against the PKK. Across the border in Syria, the operation, after an operation, Olive Branch against the PKK's offshoot, the YPG. Internally, the economy not doing so well. The lira just, is... Just posted the, the highest uh, growth rate, yes. But the Lira, Lira, Lira is suffering. Is People on the street else. are saying, you know, there is this angst. There's this tension that is built up in society because of Syria, because of the PKK, mm -hmm. because of uh, refugees, three and a half million refugees in the country. So it's quite a critical crossroads, this, this election and what it might mean. Man. I think all these tensions actually make it necessary to make that transition from uh, the, you know, what we, what we agreed to vote yes on uh, uh, April 16th to what is actually proposed with the presidential uh, system. Uh, why wait uh, when there is, you know, when we can actually hold the elections and transition, given these tensions, given the, like you said, if there is the economic tensions, if there is social order issues uh, with the PKK, if there is, you know, counterterrorism operations uh, in Syria and, per and perhaps some are being carried out in Iraq as well. Given all these dynamics, I think it's necessary, like I said in the beginning, to transition into the new system so things can run smoother. You know, we are overlooking a, a reality here. Uh, the fact that President and, and the Prime Minister are running smoothly is due to the fact that uh, both the President and the Prime Minister are from the same party, right? If it wasn't from the same party, I mean, can you imagine run, yeah. going through all these difficulties, um, uh, you know, abroad and internally, and there is a, a, a clash between prime minister uh, and the president ideologically or personally or just different rival parties. Yeah, but wouldn't the, the entire reform of the system empower the president, presidency at the cost of parliament necessarily? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, the parliament, uh, you know, it is being portrayed as that. However, I don't agree with that because there is it actually limits some of the president's powers. The number also, of MPs will go up. The numbers of MPs will go up. Uh, that's also necessary to make the uh, representation fairer. Uh, Turkey is a grow growing population uh, with about 80 million. We cannot go ahead with just 550 uh, MPs. It needs to be uh, distributed uh, so that it reflects the population's needs. You're, you're, you're an optimist. In, in, in all of this, yeah. so well, well, just you cannot bet against Turkey. That's the motto. Uh, you cannot take a position against Turkey, actually. The, 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 the point, tur Turkey, as in the Turkish people, the, Turkish the people, republic, Turkish, the government. Everything, what are you talking everything, about? Everything. Everything. That's that's uh, the the risks, economic risks that uh, you were mentioning have been going on for a long time. The, everything. Maybe the new addition is the the Syrian operation, but uh, financially. The government had actually projected this operation, and uh, the treasury. So you're saying the government preparing. can't take a risk against or the, based on the people. The existing risks are continuing, and there's nothing. The, the, the risk level ratio is not, has not changed much lately. That's the point. Oh, the exchange rate. Well, the exchange rates uh, they 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 fluctuate. They they go up, and uh, trust me, when results and with the stability, it will come down. Final question beyond elections. And I'll ask both of you this as well. Day after the election, months after the election, these reforms that were initiated with the referendum had to continue till 2019. So there was ample time for these reforms. Now, 
what do we expect? What happens now? Because the country has to make a transition, but 15, minute, uh, 15 months earlier than expected. Well, some of the uh, necessary adjustment laws are uh, being uh are going into the parliament actually as early as next week. This is what the uh, AK party said. They are discussing it with the MH MHP. Um, and, but, of course, there is more adjustments laws that needs to be in place, and that will be spread through and, the and, time. And let's not forget the judiciary has still be, is still impacted from a, you know, uh, the, most of the positions aren't filled after the coup, after uh, the judges were removed that were suspected to have links with the Fetho terror group. So there are a lot of gaps in the well, system. I, I don't actually agree that agree with that point because the, the recovery in that sense has been rather uh, quicker. Um, so the necessary bureaucratic changes, institutional changes, uh, will need to continue. However, those the changes that are necessary to be implemented prior to the elections will be implemented. Will be going through the parliament. Uh, as early as next week, I believe. Um, but the other ones, smaller changes in bureaucracy, there's a lot of small details that will need to be changing and implemented, um, and that will take a little longer time. So yeah, the economy, economy is the key. When there's political stability, economy performs stably and more. And vice versa. Exactly. So we are, we are projecting a politically stable period. So back to your 15 months question. 15 months, two years, uh, State Minister, just uh, Deputy Prime Minister Shimshek just mentioned need for fresh economic reform. So they have to And even President mind. Erdogan, in, in announcing this decision, highlighted macroeconomic issues Absolutely. as Tur a number one priority. Turkey needs reforms and Turkey needs to do more to just uh, expand the GDP and uh, level up in terms of income per capita. For that, foreign investments are key. Turkey is still a country that needs and tries but to it's also. Foreign interesting. You, you're talking about foreign investment and in, in, uh, stability economically, sure. but also regional, the regional play over Syria unfolding, maybe with Manbij in the next few months after the election. So that's also a critical point. Well, well Manbij issue is being, I think, being uh, discussed with the U.S. counterparts at the moment. Um, so that is, is not off the table for Turkey because of the YPG presence there. However, Turkey is looking to diplomatically solve the issue um, rather than an, uh, you know, necessary, rather than making it necessary to, uh, to, for a, for a cross-border operation. However, when it comes to that, those uh, economic reforms and stability and foreign direct investment, foreign direct investment in investors look for political stability ahead of an investment. So if there is political stability in Turkey, direct investment will come. Political stability, political stability, economic stability. Thank you so much. Exactly. You guys actually agreed on it by the end of it. Salim Atala yes. and Nana Chalik. Thank, Thank you. you. Turkey and Greece haven't always met eye to eye. The two countries have had alternating periods of hostility and reconciliation ever since Greece won its independence from the Ottoman Empire. They have faced off in four major wars and have come to the brink three times. Now tensions have resurfaced once again over recent events in the Mediterranean, as Courtney Keeley explains. Two NATO neighbors, Greece and Turkey, with a long history of issues, are once again at odds. Turkey's foreign minister called for both countries to focus on a more positive relationship, but also warned Greece not to provoke Turkey. They should not take steps that will strain the relations and lead to a crisis in the Aegean for no reason. When they do so, they will get a response. Tensions spiked in early March after Turkish authorities detained these two Greek soldiers. Greece says the soldiers strayed over the border by mistake. Turkey says they breached a highly sensitive military zone, possibly an act of espionage. Meanwhile, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is still demanding that Athens turn over eight Turkish soldiers who fled to Greece in a helicopter in July of 2016 on the night of the failed coup. Türkiye'de biliyorsunuz işkence, idam böyle bir şey söz konusu değil. Bunların Türkiye'ye iadesi de mümkündür çünkü bunlar bir darbe gerçekleştiren kişilerdir. Greece's justice minister recently told the Greek radio station 24-7 that they will release the Turkish soldiers from prison, but won't hand them over to Turkey. Soon after a statement, one Turkish soldier was released to a secret location. 
Greece and Turkey are also at odds over other issues. The 1923 Treaty of Lausanne handed these Aegean islands close to Turkey over to Greece. On the first Turkish presidential visit to Greece in 65 years during a tense news conference, Lausanne, şöyle olmuş böyle. President Erdogan reiterated that the treaty needs to be updated. The Greek defense minister brought up the issue again recently. We're sending a message of deterrence that if Turkey dares to question our territorial rights in the Aegean, we will deal with it in the way we dealt with it in the First World War. Turkey's EU minister dismissed the comments the next day during an EU conference in Paris. This statement should not be aired in Turkey on news bulletins. It should be aired on comedy shows. In a recent provocation in mid-April, a few Greek teenagers planted a Greek flag on a small island in southwestern Turkey. They even took a selfie. The Turkish Coast Guard quickly removed it. Then there's Cyprus, divided since 1974 into a Turkish north and a Greek south, with no resolution in sight. Courtney Keeley, Straight Talk. And joining me now to discuss this further is Faruk Luolu. He's a former Turkish ambassador to the United States and Pavlos Elefteriades, who is a professor at the University of Oxford. Let's begin with you, Pavlos. Why the saber rattling now? Well, I think there are domestic reasons uh, on, on both sides. Uh, I mean, as far as I can see from the Greek point of view, the Greek government is in a very difficult position, is highly unpopular. Uh, the plans it made for a clean exit from the program is not looking it to be working very well. Um, the economy is not uh, recovering, or at least not fast enough. There is this huge problems with unemployment and poverty and so on, as you, as you know. So this is a way for them to score some domestic points. That's, I, I don't read anything else. We saw with the, the whole refugee migrant crisis of... Uh, tens of thousands of people yeah. making their way across the Aegean into Greece, there was some sort of coordination, communication between Turkey and Greece, and actually they were coordinating a lot of these efforts, especially off of Lesbos. We've come a long way since then, haven't we, Ambassador? But that coordination uh, still uh, is in place, and it is continuing, and it's very effective, I mean, to the benefit of uh, not only Greece and Turkey, but the European Union, and especially, of course, uh, uh, the people who try to uh, cross uh, uh, the Aegean uh, uh, in, into Europe. Uh, I think uh, despite all the tensions, uh, Turkey and Greece both recognize the fact that they are neighbors, that they stand uh, to benefit most from any cooperation, any collaboration on any issue. And uh, this uh, refugee uh, control of uh, the passages of uh, uh, refugees uh, in the Aegean uh, is, uh, is an outstanding example. I think um, uh, in uh, answer to your uh, question to Paulus, uh, uh, the problem is the long-standing problems between Turkey and Greece, uh, mostly on the Aegean and the uh, 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 Turkish minority in uh, Western Thrace, uh, these long-standing problems have not been resolved. But now there are new ones being added to it. So the chronic tension between Turkey and uh, uh, Greece uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, really hurting both sides, as uh, Paolo said, for domestic reasons and for other reasons. A long-running Ottoman rule over Greece, uh, tensions from the Greco-Turkish war uh, you know, in the 1919 onwards. A lot has gone on between these two countries, hasn't it, Paolo? Well, yes, but that's uh, it's not ancient history, but it's very old history now. But as, and, uh, as the ambassador was saying, if you have old problems, new ones. True, but if you have visionary leaders, when you had Venizelos and Kemal Ataturk, you can have a peace treaty and make very, very uh, dramatic decisions. After a to war. Go forward after war. And indeed, I mean, for me, the model is France and Germany. After many, many wars, they set up a, a legal uh, framework for not just cooperation, but integration, interdependence on the basis of the rule of law. And I, I see no reason why Greece and Turkey couldn't do the same, either within the European Union, for me the ideal scenario, or in some other way. 
Here the problem lies with Turkey, I'm afraid, and I, I, I would like to, to, to hear what Farouk has to say about this, because a, a real opportunity was missed in 1982 with the, law, the new convention of the law of the sea, where Turkey is the, one, the only European state, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that doesn't accept this new convention on the law of the sea. Greece accepts it, has ratified it, all the European nations have ratified it, and Tur Turkey is the only one who doesn't want to settle these disputes on the basis of the existing code of the law of the sea. So I, I think uh, President Erdogan inherited this problem, but I think a very courageous Turkish leader would say, okay, right, look at this law of the sea convention. Every country in the world has uh, recognized it. Let's see if we can work with it. And you can, and there was some, I suppose, fear at the beginning that it would work against the interests of Turkey. But if you look at the decisions of the International Court of Justice on the delimitation of maritime zones, it has gone more or less, I mean, these are legal technical arguments, I don't want to go into them at all, but it, it, it reflects some of the concerns of equitable resolution of Turkey in the case in uh, Ukraine and Romania and other cases. So I think the law of the sea, for me, it should be the starting point for a, law, uh, you know, a legal framework for the resolving this, this dispute. That's how Germany and France did it. And that's how Gre Greece and Turkey should do it. Ambassador. I think, you know, <coughs> Turkish-Greek uh, friendship does not uh, really depend solely on the signing of the Convention on the Law of the Sea. The reason uh, why uh, Turkey did not sign it, uh, along with the United States, by the way, the U.S. has not signed it either, uh, is because uh, of the particularities, the special characteristics and uh, formation uh, of uh, uh, different elements in the Aegean. Uh, so that uh, some of the provisions of the uh, law of the sea are applicable, uh, but some are not. This is uh, the Turkish point of view. But in any case- Are the case, Kardak Islands, for example? Resolved, yes, or will course, that issue be? Uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, territorial waters, uh, continental shelf, exclusive economic zone. Yes, these are matters taken up in uh, the law of the sea. So the question again to Pavlos: How can you sign an agreement if there are still disputed areas well, in the I, region? Well, I'm a practicing lawyer. You know, I go to court often, and I, in fact, in, in planning disputes, it is land development disputes. You always start from the plan to see who has what rights. The plans are made under an existing framework of law. So it's that, that is the problem. I have spent years dealing with these problems, uh, Turkish-Greek problems and the problem of Cyprus. Uh, I am perfectly convinced uh, that you can resolve all these issues uh, between Turkey and Greece through negotiations, sometimes looking at the law of the sea, sometimes looking at uh, other arrangements that are uh, elements uh, of the Aegean uh, disputes that can be settled in terms of international law, including the law of the sea, and there are uh, matters that can be resolved through bilateral negotiations. Uh, as we talked uh, earlier, I told Paolo, Paulus that uh, uh, Greek politicians are under far greater pressure from their public uh, about uh, their approach to the resolution of these uh, problems. It is far more difficult for them. Well, it's a, it's a very co a sensitive issue for Greeks. Yes, but so it is. But so it is for Turkey. But the uh, 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 difference between Turkey and Greece is that Turkey is uh, much more ready and readily prepared to accept. I almost a see a mirror argument emerging uh, here. Pavlos is saying that the Greeks are ready, some... that they are willing, and uh, the ambassador is saying that the Turks are ready. So it seems there, seems there is a middle ground. We, right, exactly. But <laughs> well, if both sides are ready, <laughs> then we have to find On this table, <laughs> not in Athens yeah, and Ankara. I, I wouldn't go into a negotiation with someone when part of the negotiation is what is the underlying law. So if I'm in a negotiation with Donald Trump about property, and he says, I'm going to write the property law as well while we negotiate. I wouldn't do that. I'm going to go to negotiation with Donald Trump, with anyone, especially a bigger country with a, a bigger military, if we said, these are the ground rules. Let's agree the ground, and then we negotiate. The law of the sea has a process for the settlement of disputes. So the process of negotiation is within that convention. So I see no problem for Turkey entering into the system and say, these are the rules. And if Turkey accepted international law, then the Greek public, which is as patriotic as the Turkish public, I'm sure, uh, they would be perfectly happy to accept compromise. The Turks would say that if Greek accepted certain things, Greece the law said, on the let, ground. Let's, take let, let's, let's move on. These are both, these yeah. are both, yeah. uh, these are both two one. NATO countries. I'll, I'll, get to, I'll, I'll get to you, Ambassador. These are both 
important NATO countries, part of the NATO alliance. Can we realistically expect a war in this day and age between two NATO allies? First, on the previous part of the discussion, if uh, the law of the sea was uh, or is so omnipotent, then there would be no disputes anywhere in, uh, on this uh, uh, earth, uh, anywhere in uh, you know Far East, uh, the Atlantic, the Pacific, whatever. To answer your question, uh, a war between Turkey and Greece is certainly nonsensical. But you ca can you rule it out? Uh, no, you cannot rule it out uh, because uh, uh, tensions are chronic and always tight uh, between uh, Turkey and Greece. And any small incident has the potential to escalate and get out of hand. Ambassador Luolu, thank you so much, Papos. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with Neil Mustafa. If you've got any comments or suggestions, do share them with us on Twitter at hashtag Straight Talk. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye.